Welcome to Beauty and the Biz. Discover how to grow your practice with effective cosmetic patient attraction, conversion, and retention advice from author, speaker, trainer, and cosmetic practice business and marketing coach, Catherine Maley, MBA. business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patient and more profit. So today's special guest is Dino Eliasina of Sumia. I'm going to ask him to pronounce that eventually. <laughs> now, he's a board-certified plastic surgeon practicing in my neighborhood, San Francisco, and the surrounding Bay Area. And he's been in practice for over 11 years now. Now, Dr. Dino, as his patients call him, because you can hear his last name is a tough one, he obtained his medical degree at the University of Southern California School of Medicine, where he was top 100% of his class, and then he scored in the top 100% or 1% nationally. So he's a smarty pants. Now, he did his training at the University of California, San Francisco, and he did a fellowship at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. Dr. Dino then joined the Martin Clinic of Plastic Surgeon, uh, of Plastic Surgery, and you know that is Dr. Timothy Martin, who has a very big name in our industry. He's a world-recognized plastic surgeon. Now, Dr. Dino is sought after as a speaker at the national and international plastic surgery meetings on facial rejuvenation and fat grafting. He also does a lot of writing in the um, Medical Society books. So, Dr. Dino, welcome to Beauty and the Biz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Sure. So just tell me, um, where did you start? Did, did you come from New York or San Francisco? Are you East Coast or West Coast? Uh, West Coast, Bay Area, South Bay. Um, I grew up in San Jose, went to high school there. Um, oh, no and then kind of from there uh, went off. <laughs> oh, good for you. Most people like end up in California somehow later, but you came here. You were starting here. I came back. Yeah, I spent, I, I, I did do the thing in New York for a year, but other than that, I was always in California. Um, okay. New York was a great experience. I love being there, but ultimately I wanted to be kind of close to home. Okay. Um, the New York, isn't that a different? Um, when you look at um, the East Coast versus the West Coast, um, how different is it? Yeah, very different. At least within our, I mean, obviously there's so many differences, but uh, yeah. you know, in a plastic surgery world, there's definitely different styles in the East Coast that you can see, you know, and I think it mirrors the, the you know, socially, the, the society as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it was an interesting experience. Um, I do a lot of consulting in New York, and I'm originally from Chicago, so I have that, let's get it done right now, let's get to the point, da, da, da. And, but I also do a lot of consulting in, like, let's say the southern state, and it's all, I need to, like, put a muzzle on me and just feel different, you know? I think human beings are the same, basically the same, but I think we all have a different road of getting there, and we all have our nuances, and boy, New York is tough crowd. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, they're, uh, it's a fast paced moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not right now, but yeah. Um, so tell me, I love talking about the journey. So how did you end up? Did you wake up one day and say, I want to be a plastic surgeon? Are you one of those people who at three years old, you knew what you wanted to do? Or Well, I wanted to be a heart surgeon when I was little. Actually. Wow. So I always be a surgeon for some too. reason. Yeah. When you're young, I don't think you really know, but so somehow it actually worked out. But, but, um, yeah, I had some family members that were surgeons and, you know, I wanted to do something really challenging and, you know, I thought that sort of aiming high and, and, um, and then as I kind of went along through med school, I, I sort of, you know, cardiothoracic surgery has a really hard lifestyle, you know, they are, um, it's hard to ever have a life outside of it. Um, and plastic surgery just really appealed visually to me. I guess I was a little bit more of a aesthetic kind of person or had a little bit of, you know, artsy side than I thought. And I was just kind of drawn to it once I did rotations. And, and then that was it. So I mostly started off on the path I always wanted to be on, but I veered a little towards plastic which turned out great because I really love, you know, what I do. But when you graduate, first of all, um, you're, you've only been out 11 years, so maybe it has changed. But while you were in med school, were they also teaching you the business and marketing side of plastic surgery? Zero. Zero. Really? Zero. Isn't that insane? Okay, it so is, yeah. were you on the side trying to figure out, like, how, what is your plan to enter this marketplace with, you know, thousands you know, and thousands of others? Yeah, um, I wasn't, you know, um, I kind of 
my plan was mostly um, how, you know, what kind of practice do I want? Um, and, you know, but somewhere around my fourth or fifth year of residency training, so even in residency training where you're really getting trained to go out in the world, you still don't learn anything about business or marketing. I think some specialties do it better than others, but there's this sort of feeling within general surgery and plastic surgery, you know, it's very academic. And the idea is that if you're thinking about making money, you're just somehow, um, you know, like not principled enough or, you know, you have poor values. So they kind of almost frown upon, you know, business education in a way, you know, and it's just not the real world. So um, we didn't learn anything. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, I, I, I visited Dr. Martin and we kind of hit it off a little bit and he offered me, you know, I was going to do my fellowship in New York and he said, when you get back, you might want to consider joining us. And to me, it had nothing to do with business. I just, you know, admired him so much and the office was beautiful and the practice just seemed amazingly run. So it was just like this gift landed in my lap. I didn't really plan much about business, to be honest with you. I just... Um, fell into something that was amazing, you know, and I just got really lucky, to be honest with you. Okay, that, that was uh, a gift, because... It was, totally. Did you know how big of a deal he was? I know, yeah, oh, I did know, I did. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, the business side of things, I, I you just kind of learn along, along the way, um, you know, it, over these 10 years, I talked to a lot of friends that, you know, they're, they're building from scratch. And, you know, so I've watched a lot of people do it. Um, um, but from, from my standpoint, I just had to adapt to this nice culture and um, uh, business that was already built there. And, and he ran, a, he ran and still does run a very um, sort of good practice, um, I think, all the way around, you know, the way I would like to do it myself. Um, so I've just had to kind of integrate myself um, and, and sort of, again, I've just been really lucky to learn from that side of things. All right, um, and, and that's the pearl. If you if you can hook up with somebody who's been there, done that, and you can yeah. role model whatever they've done, why reinvent that wheel? No, as exactly. Long, yeah, as exactly. long as you can, um, like, park your ego a bit because you're not the, you know, you're not the Lion King now. You're, was, you're part uh, of. Yeah, that was that was fine with me yeah. because um, he was welcoming. He wanted me to succeed. Um, he helped me genuinely, you know, genuinely wanted to see me do well. And um, how am I? I mean, everything I've thought of, he's been spent, you know, that comes to my mind, you know, um, he's probably thought of a million times already, you know, 20, 30 years into it. So um, I, I just, you know, just tried to kind of learn basically, you know, um, and that's it. And um, Still to this day, I, I don't have much to share. Uh, you know, we taught, we we enjoy sort of the camaraderie, and you know, um, we we bounce things off each other, sort of in a in a technical way, because that's really where we we enjoy things. You know, the the art of of, of surgery, and you know, the, we both have a very good passion for technically what we're doing. Um, and so that that's been great, um, but really from the business side of things, I don't really think I've added much. You know, I've just tried to really integrate the the general philosophy, you know, of mm -hmm. of how we do things, which is very sort of patient based. You know, um, just you know, be a good role model for the staff, um, center everything on providing a good experience for patients, um, and really try to get the staff to buy in, and then you know, let them do their job. And that's really what I think. Um, when, I, when I think about uh, running a good business, um, I think it's sort of, sort of having the right values and being a good example. You know, to me, that's like the core of it. When I watch doctors try to work together, I, I always go back to the books that I used to read in business school, which was, you've got to share the same values if you're going to both be leading that team. Because if one of you has one set of values and it comes across and the staff like, what are we doing with you know? So um, I'll bet you, I'll bet if you actually dissected it, I'll bet your values are super similar. Because if it's, has it been this simple or have there been challenges of working with someone else's staff or when there's a fork there's in the road? Little, now very little, you know, in the beginning, very little, because I think, again, I was welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt wanted, to, you know, I, I felt wanted and I felt um, people were helping me, you know, mm -hmm. that they genuinely wanted me to succeed. Um, so even if there were months in a row, as long as I felt that energy was there, 
then I, I, I didn't mind, you know, those are easy to manage, at, you know, so mm -hmm. at, a, at, at the core of it, I felt like uh, I was kind of accepted, wanted, and they wanted me to succeed everybody in the office. And again, that all just starts with, with, uh, with Tim kind of top down, you know, setting that example for everyone. And, and basically, you know, I've tried to learn as much as I can from him. So even though maybe some of our values are similar, you know, he's just a great role model. And I've tried to integrate as much as I can from him and, and um, kind of like learn a lot of new values from him too. You know? So um, uh, it's been easy to just kind of fall back and, you know, let him be our leader because he is a great leader. Mm -hmm. He is. Um, by the way, do you have your own operating suite? within your building or your practice or do you uh, we yeah we do so um uh, we have uh, sort of everything in the office um you know the clinic side we have one operating room which the two of us share um so basically we're operating two to three days a week each um we have the overnight suite that patients stay at uh for um you know generally for the larger cases you know the facebook that sort of thing um, and then um, we've been in, in the process of developing a more extended stay option, um, which for out of town, Dr. Martin has a lot of out of town uh, patients, so giving them a place, uh, a very nice kind of curated place to stay uh, for, for a little bit of a longer period of time. Um, that's kind of in the work. So well, you're surrounded nice, by five-star hotels. Can't you just set up a system? There's now? that too, but you know, it, he's, uh, he's, quite particular in oh. terms of the, the service he wants to provide. Um, so uh, I think it's great to have it all encompassed, you know, their whole experience. So if um, I have a facelift, uh, will a limo pick me up and take me, whisk me away to the Napa Valley to a five-star resort? Is that, that the kind of thing? Sure? That could be arranged if you like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but is that the kind of thing he's talking about? Or just um, no, it's, it's nearby. It's actually um, just a condo, kind of like an Airbnb. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that sorry, makes so much more sense. Okay. Here. Yeah, it's very close to the office, okay. so it, it'll allow us to visit them if necessary. And um, um, yeah, just kind of like an Airbnb, something a little more like an extended stay up. All right, that's terrific. Now, do you share staff, or do you have we, your own staff? He has his own staff. No. Yeah, everybody is shared. We've been that way since since day one. Actually. Gotcha. Do you have your own coordinator or do you share a coordinator as well? We, um, we have two coordinators in the office, um, but they, one is primarily more mine, but they actually overlap. So um, we pretty much share the two coordinators as well. All right. And just out of curiosity, when it comes to, to leads, new leads coming in, yes. does everybody call and say who they want? Or if they say, I just want one of them, who's ever, how does that work out? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, generally, people are are um, calling, asking for one of us. You know, we're we're very separate. You know, I mean, he's so much further ahead of me in terms of experience. So he's got his own routes of kind of marketing. You know, and and the way patients come to him, um, which is almost a lack of marketing, to be honest with you. Yeah, we'll uh, talk just, about that next. You know, yeah. yeah, very entrenched kind of word of mouth. Uh, it, yeah, it's really it's crazy. Um, whereas you know, I'm. Um, in that sense, at least a little bit more modern in the approach. And I think these avenues create, you know, where the, the lead comes through, basically. So, it, you know, occasionally we'll get a patient that hears about both of us and might come across both of us. And, and then we'll, we're fine if they both want to, um, if they want to consult with both of us. You know, we just sort of let it happen organically. Um, and if they choose one or the other, neither of us. Will mind actually, you know. Is there a here. big price difference between the two of you? So they there, could start with uh, Tim and work their way down, or? Yeah, I mean, we there's not a huge price difference, but, but there is, um, and we're very open about that. You know, um, you, you know, if you have, you know, ten, I, I don't know how many years difference we are now, mm -hmm. but you know, fifteen, twenty, whatever years mm -hmm. difference, then you know you've earned a lot to be able to do that. I feel, you know, mm -hmm. so. Um, yeah, um, and that, you know, everybody, every patient's different. They all have right. different criteria for what they choose. And, um, you know, it, that we just kind of, now, you know, from a philosophy standpoint, at least for facial aging surgery, we're very, very similar because I'm basically have copied him. You know, he's my teacher and I, I pretty much do everything he does. Um, you know, in the, again, in the beginning, I just tried to copy. I tried to be the best copy I could be. Yeah. Um, and, and, and now that I've sort of gotten to that point and I'm mostly there, 
Um, you know, now I can maybe start to find my own path a little bit, but um, I, I didn't want to try to do that too soon because you can miss so many things that you can still learn, you know, I'm still learning from him so much. Um, uh, but, you know, at some point I'll have to kind of try to, you know, push things forward um, from, from everything that he's taught me, you know, so uh, I don't know if I'm there yet, but um, well, um, so for the most part, our products are sort of similar right now to what we are. Okay. But from a business point of view, it's really helpful when, um, like, let's say your receptionist has this caller who just got sticker shock, you know, who just heard Tim Hortons numbers and got sticker right. shock. It's right. really helpful to say, because you can hear the patient, the caller's going to hang up. And you can, it's right. really helpful to say, well, I do have another op option for you. Um, right. This price is the issue. And then you, right. but you don't sell you as, Kmart, you just say he does right. have an associate who has right. 11 years of experience. Um, right. However, he does have considerably less pricing, you know, rates. Uh, would, are you interested in that? Um, right. I like using that because you'd rather take, Tim Martin would rather have half of something than zero, you know, 100% of nothing. Yeah, of course. Both of yeah, you would, you know? yeah, of course. We'd rather keep it in the clinic. And, yeah. and the way you're saying it is right. You have to be delicate how you're yeah. saying it. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously you know how to do that. Uh, um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's, a, but you know, funny enough, it hasn't come up that much. No In 11 years, I don't think, I, I, I can't think of many patients who basically kind of consulted both and, and sort of went my way because of cost. Mm -hmm. um, I think when they seek him out, maybe they already know that to some degree. Generally, they go his way, you know. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, it just doesn't come up that often. Funny, okay. you know? I just know a yeah. lot of consumers still do not realize how much good plastic surgery can cost, and some of them just are completely ill-informed or uninformed, yeah. or they've been on the wrong website. And um, sticker shock can often be a big issue, you know. So right. I'm just always right. trying to address it. How do we? Right. How do we? First of all, how do we not get to that point where they have sticker shock? Like, shouldn't we have had some discussion before that? Right, um, right. And especially in your building, how many plastic surgeons are in your building, by the way? I need to count uh, that up. I would guess maybe seven to ten. Sometimes there's a <laughs> lot. Yeah, we're a, you know not as many dentists, but definitely okay. a lot of plastic surgeons. My yeah. very first client was on the top floor of the penthouse. Isn't that funny? Really? Yeah, yeah, that's and really yeah, yeah, whatever. That's a long story. Yeah, but um, okay. Um, so so. Business-wise, you're very happy with your business model. Are you a partner? Are you a associate? Like, is there any plan for you two to expand together? Or, um, you know, I, um, we, I, I, I guess I'm an associate okay. technically. Um, we, I don't even know necessarily how to describe it. I mean, he owns the practice, but we basically share everything. Okay. Um, we share all the costs. Um, so I don't know, we sort of function like, um, you know, uh, partners in a way, um, it, it's the same sort of setup we had when we started and we've never really gone back and changed it because everything's been fine, yeah. you know, um, so, you know, we're not really, um, I'm not really looking to expand so much as I am, um, I'm looking to ultimately my, my kind of career goal is at this point I've matured to the point where I've, I've really focused on the surgeries that I really love doing. I really love doing facial aging surgery and primary rhinoplasty. Those are the two things I love. And all I'm really trying to do is keep a steady flow of those patients so I can do those surgeries. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really don't, you know, as long as my two to three today, two, two days, three days a week surgery schedule is full doing those two procedures, mm -hmm. I'm happy. That's all I want to get to. And I just want to keep doing it better and better, you know, uh, technically do it better, provide a better experience for patients, um, expose it out to the outer world better. And then, you know, professionally, I do enjoy sort of uh, teaching it and, and that sort of thing as well. But that's it. It's not much growth as it is sort of refinement. You know, yeah. that's kind of how I think of it. So from a business standpoint, I mean, you can run circles around what I know. Um, I don't think I can really provide a lot there, but I think at its core, there's, it makes a lot of business sense because it's very old school and simple, but if you're providing a good product and patients feel like they, you're being very straightforward with, you know, what you're, what you're marketing to them, what you're providing to them, how you take care of them, you know, um, it, it, people gloss over that a lot, but that's, I think, the big chunk of what 
important in what we do. So without getting too fancy, I feel like I'm I'm basically being a good businessman. You know right. what I mean? Right. And there's no one way to do it either. Um, are you um, have you looked at your revenues, surgical versus non-surgical? Are you in are you involved in the non-surgical or that's a non-issue for you guys? Well, um, I uh, initially when I first started, I didn't have any cases to do. I, I wanted to do I, I wanted to do surgery obviously, but I didn't have much. And Dr. Martin was gracious enough to give me a lot of his injectable patient cases. Mm -hmm. So I started off building an injectable practice, and then slowly as the surgery practice grew, I started trying to transfer those patients to our nurse injector. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, um, and she's been great. She's built up a nice practice. Um, and we haven't aggressively built that. And maybe that's an area it would be nice to grow a little bit because it doesn't require, you know, it, again, it's just taking care of our own patients, basically. Um, uh, but it's been a little tricky right now. Um, she's been on maternity leave. You know, COVID's kind of happened. So we've been, a, the, the injectable side's been suffering a little bit. Um, but yeah, that is something we want to build up at least you know, we have the infrastructure for it, um, we have the space, and we have kind of the patient volume. So from the business side, that's sort of easy to build, and it's kind of, we want to take care of our own patients. Um, but yeah, that, that could be helped a little bit, um, especially we do a lot of facial surgery, so we can definitely integrate kind of facial, you know, non-surgical a little better. That is an area of growth. But again, I'm not looking to expand it so much that you know, you open up another office and, you, you know, I, it's a more limited extension, I guess, you know. Um, speaking of the non-surgical, how do you as a surgeon, because you want to do surgery and you know the patients nowadays, they've heard, oh, I can just fill this up. I, I just need some filler. They don't even know, like, how do you present filler versus fat grafting versus facelift? Like, because yeah. that becomes a very long discussion and it gets complicated for the woman who's trying yeah. to figure out... First of all, you insulted her. She's like, I don't need a facelift. I just need a little something. Because -some. yeah. <laughs> I am that woman. Um, but how do you have that conversation yeah. in a in a, a, a reasonable amount of time? In brief, yeah, I, I kind of like to summarize it in a few ways um, to make it simple. I, I basically like to tell patients, you know, in the upper two thirds of the face, you can get away. Um, so I like to talk about it location wise and age wise, sort of two ways to mention. In the upper two thirds of the face, you can get away with injectables for a long time. And maybe even kind of permanently, if you really want it. Um, uh, you know, now maybe eventually you might need something for the eyes, but I think in the the mid face and around the eyes, volume is the big issue. So adding volume, which you can do with fillers, you'll get a great result, and you might not need a lot more than that. As you get to kind of the jawline, neck area, at some point, if there's enough laxity, um, fillers can get you there a little bit, maybe in the 30s and 40s, but definitely by mid 40s and up. Um, you know, when, once you have laxity, the only solution is surgery. And I think there's a lot of effort that is put by some of the non-surgical people to push the limits of things like lasers and Ulthera and Thermage. And I, my personal belief is those just don't work at all. And they, they actually make surgery more difficult for me. They cause more damage to the yeah. <laughs> yeah. So once people are to the point where they want to do sort of some more classic lifting type things, then I think back grafting is a better option. Because if you're in the operating room, see the problems with back grafting are that it has more recovery time and you got to do it in an operating room, right? And so if you're going to piggyback it onto a surgical lift, then now the downsides are gone, right? And now you get the upside, which is longevity, right? It lasts longer than fillers. And that is cheap, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay Allergan, you know, $500 a syringe. You just pay a, a basic kind of surgeon fee, which I promise is a lot less than what you know these large companies charge. Uh, and and you can piggyback it onto the facelift. Um, and we can be more comprehensive. You know, we have a very good understanding of all the little areas that need a little volume. It's very very nuanced how to really shape a face well, and it's hard to do it in one sitting with filler. You know, it's just it's, it's a lot. So to be able to, we have one opportunity in surgery to do it with that, and so we try that and. It really may, takes the faceless to another level. In life. And would you say, when you explain yeah. it like that, do most, I'll just say women, do most women agree? Do, do they go for it? Yeah, I, I, with fat grafting, mm -hmm. sure. I mean, just about probably 90 plus percent of the faceless I do, I'm doing with fat grafting. Because I can kind of, I can make them see the logic in it, you know. Um, but the other way that I'll talk about fat versus filler is just from an age thing. 
I say when you're in your, you know, maybe 20s, but kind of 30s and 40s, I think you need less volume and you may not be ready for surgery. So filler makes a lot of sense. But once you kind of get into the facelift age group and you're kind of 50 and above classically, you know, then fat resting to me makes a lot of sense. That's to me the simplest way to put it. Well, I hear you. Yes. I've, I've experienced all of that. Yes. It's fantastic. <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> so um, we're going to switch gears and talk about marketing. Because sure. the craziest thing about Tim Martin is you can't find him anywhere. And um, yeah. I've known him for decades. And I think, how, where's his website? And then someone said, no, he doesn't have a website. And I said, what are you talking about? How, how do you not have a website? Like, I've never heard of anything like that. And I ran into him actually in Switzerland. And I said, where's your website? <laughs> and his, his girlfriend was there and she said, he just doesn't have one. And I think, what's up? So I assume you have a beautiful website. What, what's, the, what, what's up? Do you market yourself separately or as a yeah. practice? Uh, uh, he might, yeah, he might be the last plastic surgeon on earth to have a website. That's kind of a cool, uh, I mean, I wish I could say that. Uh, but I mean, yeah, he's just so focused on this kind of old school mentality of just do a fantastic job, take care of patients. You know, he teaches a lot and he gets a lot of patients. I mean, he's just built such a word of mouth kind of practice that um, he just doesn't really, really need it anymore. Now, I do think that... Um, you still, I mean, I, I think he, he, he pro, I don't want to speak for him, but I, he probably would like to have those things. I don't think he's purposely trying not to do it. Um, but, you know, at some point, it, it just doesn't have the, the same sort of um, uh, 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 kind of draw to do it as you, if you were a young surgeon, you know, you obviously you need it. I clearly needed to do a lot of marketing, you know. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I started with a website and then the next phase in my kind of marketing plan was um, trying to get good reviews. I think I sort of felt, you know, 10 years ago, that was like the key thing to do. Mm -hmm. And initially, I think my practice was helped a lot through Yelp. Mm -hmm. And that built me up initially, you know, nice website, Yelp. And then, you know, again, I was going to ultimately rely on, I want to provide as the best product I can. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to over uh, understate that. My goal was always, how do I learn to do this operation better? That was, that's my number one form of marketing. And I, and I really, um, that's underneath it all. You know, I, I feel like marketing now, now that I've gotten, you know, I've spent really kind of 10 years really focused on honing surgery. And I still do. That's my joy. You know, that's what I enjoy doing. So that's what I'm going to focus on. But what, now that I've done that, I feel like it's gotten a little more fun to market because, um, I can sort of now kind of like show it a little bit, you know. You show killer before yeah. and after photos, by the way, at the medical meetings. I've seen you speak and your photos are killer. And it shows mm -hmm. that you have gone the extra mile. You didn't just learn how to do a facelift. You learned how to do like a precision, like the nuances to it. Yeah, that's, that's what's fun for me. You know, again, like you said, there's a million ways to do it. There's a million ways to be successful. And for me, it, it was about... Um, I, you know, I love obsessing over the little nuances of surgery and learning it. That's what's joyful for me. So uh, it turns out that also uh, works well for marketing. But if you just do it silently, you know, you're, you're never going to get your name out there. So initially, I thought reviews was the way to do it. And that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you don't have to do a lot of work for reviews. All you got to do is ask a happy patient, you know, you know, just suggest, hey, if you if you really like what you did, uh, feel free to review or let them do it without you even, you know, saying anything. But you're not um, afraid to, to ask them for a review. Yeah, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Good. If a patient is really happy, some of them just want to know how they can support you, yep. you know. And so it's just about, um, it's not about being very aggressive with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, you get a sense they want to help you right. as well. They're, they're, they're grateful, you know. So when I get that energy kind of from a patient, then mm -hmm. I'll mention, you know, this is a great way to support us. Well, I assure you, um, they, they do it a lot. Even afraid with with that? That? They do it a lot and more often of, when you ask them versus the staff. Yeah, because oftentimes so, the doctor's shy about it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not afraid to tell them, you know, hey, please mention if there's something I'm specifically doing and I want them to talk about it. Um, I try to be very forward and say, you know, share anything, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's kind of a little negative or mm -hmm. something you didn't expect, share that. I think a, a, an honest experience is good. And, and describe the procedures, too, you know, say the names of the procedures. Um, so, so because there are rep, there are routes to educating other patients in a way, uh, the way we do things and what to expect, I think it helps the overall 
um, sort of patient experience as well for the next patient. So they mm-hmm. kind of come in for the pre, um, you know, educated, you know, programmed about what to expect. Um, so it's kind of a big circle that that is all helping, you know, each other in a way. Um, I, I think the two top things you can do in today's world are the reviews and killer before and after photos. Some surgeons still think they don't need to put their photos online, they, and they right. insist on saying, oh, no, my patients are very private about that. Right. If you have that closed-minded attitude, yes, your patients are going to be resistant, but you I, you can't say that, and then I go on somebody else's website or I work with them. They have hundreds of facial plastics right. or right. facials. I think. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Now, now, I'll tell you, um, I think where that has really now gone to an, in another direction, mm-hmm. um, and so to me, I sort of see the marketing in these kind of, you know, the the the, fun, the foundation which I described, and then kind of review. But now I feel like the next big step of that, and it kind of goes with the porn actors you're talking about, is social media. You know, um, I was a little slow to kind of really catch on to it, um, and then, but now I realize that to take it even beyond before and after. I think videos, you know, just posting lots of videos showing both before and afters, showing patients kind of reaction to all these mm-hmm. things, showing our discussion, you know, anything that you can get on video that's organic mm-hmm. um, to me is really the next level of, of marketing because, again, it just gets back to exposure of what's really happening. That's, I think, what patients really want to know. Um, and uh, we can show that in video far better than just a, a, a a um, status before and after photo. You know? Now, do you so, have a staff person following you around with an iPad or an iPhone, or are you doing your own, or how are you making that content happen? Yeah, it's really hard because I had a very hard time getting around um, something that is intruding on my very private patient surgeon interaction. You know, it, it took me a long time to be able to integrate that because I didn't want to. I didn't want the patient to feel like I was just trying to like take advantage of it. You know, it just, it didn't feel right at first. Um, So I've done it my own way, which is basically, um, the model for me has been rhinoplasty. So the facelift patients, a lot of them just aren't ready for that yet. So I I really haven't tried to do too much with that. But for the rhinoplasty patients, you know, they're mostly millennials. They're in their, you know, teens and 20s and 30s. They're much more comfortable being videos, you know. and so their comfort has made me more comfortable. Right. And so what I try to do is, um, I have a set of videos that I try to take um, the morning of surgery. Um, and I do, I do that routinely. It's now just part of my routine before and after photo. Now it's just a before and after video process. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, if they're really happy, if I have a you know, good result that I, or there's a lesson there that I want to teach, if I find a patient who I know is just very gregarious and outgoing and they're, they're happy to be on camera, and I'll just shoot a little video of them in the same pattern that I took preoperatively. If they want to say something, I'll let them do that. Um, and so because I'm, I'm archiving all the pre-op videos, you know, now I'll just take all that and I'll put it into like a nicely kind of curated video that tries to show different things. Um, if you look at our Instagram, we're, we're, I'm really trying to do that more and more now. So to me, that has made a huge difference um, in sort of marketing. I went from doing, um, I, I really narrowed my practice because of the ability social media has given me to do that. I've done it in a very fast amount of time um, because I've been able to really brand myself through Instagram. As the, the nose guy? As a nose person, you know, mm-hmm. because people click on Instagram and all they see is noses mm-hmm. and, you know, some Facebook before and after for the most part. Mm-hmm. So that right away, you know, you, there's a brand there. This right. person does these procedures, right? So you don't, you know, it, it just shows who you are, or at least even who you want to be, you know. Um, and do you scout out the influencers? Is that part of what you're doing? I know a surgeon who actually has it on his patient intake form. How many followers do you have? Like that, yeah. he takes that into consideration if he's going to work with them or not. Well, not really. Um, uh, I haven't, I've only really, I've really not worked with any influencers. Um, one, which just kind of happened organically. Um, there's a, uh, um, um, I did a rhinoplasty on a, a talk, a radio uh, show post, um, which was awesome. I mean, um, local, uh, local TV. Yeah. Local, local radio. radio? Nice. Yeah. 
she talked about it a lot. They brought me on the uh, on the on the radio to talk about it. It was, it was a lot of fun um, and it turned out well. And I, I still get referrals from was from it that, Sarah you know? and Vinny. What what is it? Was it Sarah no, and Vinny? It's, it's uh, 94.9, um, um, uh, Wild 94.9, and, okay. and um, Selena from the morning. Uh, oh, that's show. terrific. Yeah, they were really nice, um, and, and they really, um, they didn't have to sort of bring me on the radio several times, and they just said a lot of nice things about me, so that was, that was really nice. Okay, nice. Um, how much yeah. time do you think you're spending on social media? Is it a per day kind of thing? Yeah, I, I, you know, the funny thing is, as much as I think it's great for business, um, I actually try not to be on there too much, because um, I, 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 I don't know how great it is uh, for us, you know, um, just personally. Um, but what I do is um, I try to capture all the content, um, and and again, once I integrate a couple videos that I think will make for a good, um, you know. Uh, collage video before and after kind of thing. Mm. Then I like to just forward that information to my marketing company, and then they'll they they have a videographer that that puts it all together. Um, they, I'm just kind of directing it, you know. I'm giving them a, a bit of a vision, and I and I just let them kind of run with it. And then um, who answers so, the DM? Uh, I do. Ooh. Yeah. Well, the 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 social media um, person from our company, um, Melissa, she uh, does. Some of it, I do some of it. Um, yeah, it's not so overbearing that I, I can't kind of get to them all, you know. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I'll just, um, once, once they're interested in a consult or something like that, then I forward it. Um, so I'm mostly just forwarding these things um, okay. to, to the right person. And have you figured out how to track the monetization of it? No. Okay. Um, but again, you're pretty sure you know, working. Yeah, I'm. It's kind of I think so. I mean, I, I work a little bit more on just my feeling, you know, um, what's my, what would my feeling be as a consumer? Um, I'm not that technical into these things. I don't track um, numbers. Uh, I never really have. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, my goal, I'm trying to think about it as organically as possible, which is I want to do good surgery and I just want to show that, put that surgery somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. people can see it um, and let things sort of fall as they will. You know, I feel like that's where most, you know, I only have so much energy in a day, right? And I feel like if I just focus that energy in these couple arenas, then of course I'm, I, I could be a much better on the business side of things, but the, that's what I enjoy. If I focus on that, then I feel like I'll get busy enough. You know, okay. at the end of the day, the goal is just to fill the surgery schedule. That's all I want to do. So if this accomplishes that, then I don't really need to worry too much about the numbers, you know? Right. It might go against all the principles that you teach. Um, uh, and you, like I said, you know a hundred times more about it than I do, but um, it, it kind of gets me enough, you know, patience, basically. And, well, you have to look at who you are and your marketing channel and which ones work for you and which ones don't. I'm a big firm believer in look at your numbers. Most of you, I think what's happened is if somebody shows up and really pushes you, you buy the ad or you buy the radio time or you, if, but if, if a person's doing that, um, it's a proactive kind of thing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. a lot of you will just like give all your money to the PPC guy, you know, the internet guy, or they, right. or the ad person said, okay, do this and okay, I'll do that. Um, as long as you're tracking the numbers to that, I'm, I'm all about that. Because too many right. of you have put your money in so many different baskets, but only two of them are working. So right. I always say, take it out of the other baskets, put it in these two, and stay there until it doesn't work, and then come up with another plan. So yeah, so if, if you yeah to get a little bit more detailed, uh, I, I basically um, I have one marketing company that does um, uh, it's Studio Three, and of I think course. I love them. Yeah, yeah, I had a great experience with them yeah. if anybody wants to use them good. um and uh they they do seo and social media for me so basically that's all my marketing yeah. um i i don't you know you could probably educate me about seo i again i get a sense that it still drives you know just being ranked high on google for keywords mm. seems to make sense to me right. you know still i don't know how much it does maybe you can tell me a little bit um, but the part that I feel like is ultimately long-term more powerful is the social part. So that's where I'm investing my personal energy into. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but again, I also enjoy it. I like seeing these videos, you know, showing off the work in a, in a cool way. It makes me happy, you know, so um, that's where I'm trying to focus. I will it, say but... my, my only two cents for you, the position you guys are in, um, you have a beautiful database of patients who love you, and I just hope you're keeping in touch with them and honoring their loyalty and taking yeah. care of them because um, those, I don't think you have to do any more marketing if you're taking good care of the, your internal list. You know, yeah. I mean, you guys have done the hard part. You know. Right. What are your thoughts on SEO? What are your thoughts on SEO? Like, what's the current state of uh, SEO? Well, you know how you you attend all the I attend all the marketing stuff, and and it's always SEO is dead. SEO is dead. And the point being, it is getting more difficult for a patient or a consumer to get online and say, and they don't say rhino, they say like a nose surgeon or um, nose job, nose job pricing. You know, so. Yeah. You have to figure out what those keywords are. And just when you figure it out, all the algorithms change. Um, but right. I do think your name has to be found. You, I mean, I hope to God when you guys, except for your name, <laughs> your name is too difficult. <laughs> so I love that you call yourself Dr. Dino. I hope you have, like, I hope you have an SEO search term for that, like Dr. Dino in San Francisco. I always try to think like a, like a patient does, you know, like, okay, wait a second. Right. My girlfriend mentioned Dr. Dino. And then I would go yeah, online and say, oh, Dr. Dino San Francisco. And I would hope you would. Well, up. my website is Dino MD. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. that makes it come up easier. For know. sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I must say it's getting more difficult for them to find you um, organically from the website because yeah. you're, you know, you're competing with ASAP and all those guys. But um, yeah. but um, I I do think you have to be there but somehow, some way. Um, but a lot of times it's going to be through Google, like Google reviews or what, whatever yeah. Google Quite frankly, Google owns the world. So whatever they says goes right now for the near foreseeable future. So if they think reviews are important, get Google reviews. Forget that's the Yelp. Good. Get Google reviews. You know, that's yeah, yeah. Anyway. totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I get the sensation to use all these avenues to make their decision. They probably look at each one before they ultimately kind of make a decision. So I think you need a little bit of presence, at least on some of the bigger platforms, you know. Like. Don't you think? Like what? Well, just like search wise, you kind of come up and you know, you, you, you have a website, they just kind of resonate with them a little bit. Mm -hmm. They go Yelp and oh, there's some reviews. They search you on like Facebook or Instagram right. and you're, you have a presence there. Just kind of like legitimizes you, I guess, you know. Of course, um, I would say the majority of patients are, are, they say they heard about you on, let's say, social. They went to your Instagram. But what happened was their girlfriend mentioned you or they were on Instagram and something happened and caught your, their eye. And then they went to your yeah. website and now they say they heard from you from the Internet. And that's not helpful. So it's really difficult to track nowadays. And that's why you're that's trying right. to be everywhere doing everything. I have yeah. a video called The Content Creation Machine. And yeah. it's um it's all about cross cross referencing everything. So when you have a right. piece of video, get it on everything humanly possible. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. um to wrap things up, what's one of the biggest mistakes you've made, and what did you learn from it? Well, we're talking about professionally. Yeah. <laughs> professionally. <laughs> uh, I would probably say that I was kind of late to really um uh embrace social media. You know, um, I was kind of humming along with just sort of reviews and thinking about the work. And I saw a lot of my friends really get aggressive on social media. And I thought it was sort of silly at the time, you know. And now I kind of feel like there's more advantages than just the marketing side. It's interesting to me that in, in you know, during, during COVID, I did a lot of virtual consults. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a lot of the patients, I, I started, I, and, I, and this happens more and more to me, that I start to get a sense that, you know, in the old days, consults for me, in old days, I just mean like, you know, five, six years ago, um, they were there like really kind of trying to get to know me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now through social media, they almost already have determined they want to choose me. And they're there more as a formality. They just want to sort of like hear my voice, you know, just make, a, make some kind of connection, make sure I'm not like a crazy person. And um, you know, get some details of the questions they want answered, but they almost seem sort of pre-selected in a way. And it's really taught me that the more we are really open about every step of things um, and 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 show that all on Instagram, they comb through it. They comb through all these videos, and and they're kind of like they they have all their questions answered. You know, at the end of the day, people want to just 
know what kind of results they can get, get all their questions answered, and, and sort of move forward. And, um, and it seems like we can do a lot of that process just online, you know, as part of the search process, mm -hmm. the, the education just goes with it, you know, For sure. and, and so that makes our job a lot easier. Um, so there's all these other benefits of social media and, and all that that I really didn't fully understand. You know, why couldn't you just do that on your website? But it's actually, it seems easier to, to do it through Instagram, you know. Um, updating a website isn't as easy as just kind of continually posting every day, um, uh, you know. So it seems like a more dynamic version of, of our content, you know, um, a, a more, an, an easier version. So, so it took me a little while to really understand that, and now I'm kind of all aboard it. Um, but, you know, everyone else got it before I did. <laughs> well, the consumers are going to demand it because nowadays you don't get to be on a pedestal. They want to know you as a person, and they want to trust that you're who would you say you're going to, you are. And right. you just show so much more personality and video. And Instagram, you did the cutest post with your wife. And <laughs> that is so endearing. I, I, did you get a ton of response from that? Did, yeah. Oh my God. I mean, we I'm women, kidding. that's what we want. We want a man that says, oh my God, she's my life, you know, that kind of thing. <sighs> it's just so good for you. That, that had to bump you up a few, a few notches. Well, it really is. It's the truth. But uh, I, I, I kind okay. of struggle with, um, with uh, trying to get too personal. I, know. I almost like don't, I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out where that line is for me personally. Um, you know, I know patients want to get to know us, and I probably um, should kind of post more videos of just me maybe discussing things so they can get to know me better. Um, it took me a while to get to that point, and I, I'm not, I, I'm, um, I don't know, you, you want to put a really good, um, like the videos for me are very carefully created, and it, it takes a lot of energy for me maybe to do that also personally, you know, to personally put videos out there. I'm, I'm, I might be a little too, um, um, I don't know. I, I just want that carefully crafted as well. And I don't think you really need to. You can just be kind of not not be so polished and, and just put it out there and it works work fine. Um, but it's something I'm learning, you know, maybe I'll go more in that direction. Um, but I don't know. I, I'd still rather keep it professional, you know, than to... Um, get too personal because I don't know how much that really helps um, people really uh, understand what we're providing. You know, I think some people go way far in the wrong direction in terms of just, you know, it has nothing to do with plastic surgery or anything anymore, you know, yeah. and they just want to kind of be Instagram famous. Right. Um, but the women the love to know, like if you're, um, uh, if you're a runner and they're a runner, it's a great bonding experience. If you love dogs, oh my God, I love dogs. It's a very yeah. bonding thing. So I would do yeah. some of that. I probably would stay away from politics at this point. It's just too hot of a topic, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I do know the consumer is looking to bond with you and find yeah. pieces that she, well, she'll sell that. She'll say that to you too. When she meets you, she'll say, like yeah. if you had a dog, oh my God, I love your dog. You know? and, yeah. um, so That's I, something I could be better at for sure. Do you have you a know? dog? Uh, you know, a little, uh, I do, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bring him out. Or him or her, they love that. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. We, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Part of it is also my personality. I'm slightly yeah. more of a um, kind of introverted person. Yeah. And so maybe that shows a little, too. So in some ways, I'm showing my personality a little bit by not yeah. showing as much. Right. You know? That's a daring, too. <laughs> it's honest. You know? <laughs> All right. So the last question, as long as we're on that topic, what's something that we do not know about you that's pretty darn interesting? Uh... I don't know. Um, I've, you know, as again, as I've matured a little bit in practice, I've finally been able to think like, what are my, you know, what kind of hobbies do I want to develop? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't really have that many. <laughs> last year, I started, um, I always wanted to play the guitar. So I started taking oh, guitar lessons. Last year. And I did it for like six months. I was really into it. And then I don't know what happened. I just kind of put it down for a while. I'd love to pick it back up again, but I don't know how much energy I had to do it. Um, I started, um, meditating recently uh, a lot for last year and so probably every morning for 10 minutes now i've been doing it for a few months kind of consistently it's like the first thing i do every morning is meditate good so for you i did the same thing opinion. for me to sit still for 10 minutes was an act of god um <laughs> but i i have been much better at it i do it twice a day you know the 10 minutes yeah. i've tried the 20 at a time i'm sorry i just i'm too darn hyper i can't but 
It has been the best thing, especially when the world feels like it's coming to an end. You better get into yourself. You better settle down and figure out who you are. Totally. I think it's the best. I mean, for 10 minutes, it's like really so valuable. It's probably the most high yield thing I think anybody can do. Uh, you know? uh, totally well, how do you do it? What, do you use an app? or do you I use, use Headspace. Um, but Headspace. the problem with Headspace app, the guy talks all the time. He talks too much. My whole yeah. problem is I need to stop thinking and talking and I just need to sit still. So I just sit very quietly and I just um, listen to my breath and, uh, and I just still for two seconds yeah. to stop everything. I don't think there's a wrong, you know, I mean, I guess there's somewhat of a wrong way, but, but there's so many ways to do it. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I use this app called Waking Up. Oh, okay. um, have you heard of it? No. Yeah, it's this guy, uh, Sam Harris. He's a well- I love well, Sam Harris. Um, yeah, it's he's his app. Trip. Have you listened What's to him that? about, have you heard his philosophy on things? He's yeah. a trip. I mean, if you think yeah. about the way he taught, he thinks we're not actually in charge of any of this. And I think, oh dear God, you're messing with my head now. So I'm not sure yeah. exactly what he's up to, but very interesting. Yeah, I, I really like that. Uh, you know what's cool about him? He's sort of a scientist. He's yeah. really kind of melding these two sort of East and yeah. West worlds, which I find really interesting. Um, so yeah, that whole kind of area is sort of my fascination. You know? Oh, that's so funny. I thought I was the yeah. only one like going guru, like um, or goofy. You know, like I live in Northern California, and I keep thinking, wow, the more I live here, the more I go inward and try to you know, figure I'm, all this out. I think Northern Cal, it's kind of the North Northern California <laughs> thing way, which I'm. Sort of proud of, you know, there's yeah. a lot of people like that here, which is cool. <laughs> All right. How can they learn more about you? If anyone wanted to get a hold of you, I know your website is dinomd.com. Um, yeah. is, are all of your Instagram and Facebook all of that? Yeah. All, yeah. Uh, it, uh, Instagram is uh, uh, Dr. Dino Eliasmia, DR, and then my full name. Mm -hmm. um, I think Facebook is Dino MD. Um, I respond to all the, the direct messaging on uh, the DMs on Instagram, so that's a simple way to reach me. Um, and my website is just Dino at, or my email is just Dino at Dino. Oh, so nice. Pretty, <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. How do you say your last name? Uh, Eliasmia. 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 Oh, dear Lord. Okay. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. Do that next time. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on Beauty in the Bed. Yeah, I really pleasure. appreciate it. Really thank, yeah, thank you. So everybody, if you got a lot out of this, would you please go to Beauty in the Biz and subscribe? And we'd love a five-star if you feel so inclined. And then if you've got any questions or feedback for me, please um, hit me up at my website. It's katherinemailey.com. And then you can always find me on Instagram like everybody else. And I'm at MBA. Thanks so much. Have a great day. We hope you found valuable insight on this episode of Beauty and the Biz. For more episodes, tools, and Catherine's free book, visit www.catherinemailey.com. That's www.catherinemailey.com. And be sure to subscribe to get the latest practice building strategies delivered to you. And don't forget to share this Beauty and the Biz podcast with your staff and colleagues.